They would come, you know, once in a while. Others would be more regular. Uthman was one of the more regular Sahaba who used to come uh, to the to, to Darul Aqam to uh, hear the talks from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to study with the Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam. And he would he would be there often. I mean, he would be he was one of the regulars, you could say. Rabbi Allah Hu Uthman Rabbi Allah uh, some of the uh, uh, stories about him uh, I wanted to share with you today just so you can kind of get an idea that how he embraced the faith and how he interacted with the faith. How, uh, what did the faith, and through this you can begin to see uh, that what did the faith, what did Islam mean to him and, uh, and how precious it was to him. Uh, Allah, may Allah be pleased with him. Uh, as you know, uh, brothers and sisters, a part of our etiquette as Muslims, um, whenever we na- mention the name of a prophet, we, we say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or alayhi salatu wa salam. You know? uh, so right, if we, and we say this for all the prophets, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa uh, meaning that uh, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon the Prophet. This is part of our respect, as a part of our etiquette towards all the Prophets, whether it's Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Isa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Musa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or Adam alayhi sallam, all of them, you know, we, we do this. And then, but for the Sahaba, we say, radiyallahu anhum, radiyallahu anhum, or, uh, which means that may Allah be pleased with them, may Allah be pleased with them, because he himself has tested Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has himself said about the Sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, that, uh, that Allah is happy with them, and, and they are happy with Him. So this is why, why we, <laughs> we say that out of uh, respect, that this is our etiquette towards this best generation of uh, human beings that live on, on the face of this earth. Um, so again, getting back to Uthman, some of uh, the stories, uh, now I'll just share a few with you, just to give you a glimpse um, into his life. And, uh, and of course, the reason we... Uh, share these stories is not just for their academic value or not just to wow, wow anybody, but the reason is so we can kind of um, glean lessons from this and kind of inspire ourselves uh, in the world that we live in today or at any era in, in, in this world. Uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, the, the famous story about Uthman radiallahu an that uh, one day Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was sitting at home in the, uh, with Aisha uh, anha, in, in her house. And you know, her house was right outside uh, the masjid. You know, that's where Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is buried. You know, when you go, go to Medina. How, how many people have been to Medina? Uh, anybody been to Medina? Just one? Two? How about the sister? Anybody? None of you all have been to Medina? A few of you. Okay. okay. Um, I, I would recommend, uh, brothers and sisters, that you try to go there at ASAP, as soon as you can go, whether it's for Umrah or for Hajj, yes. you know, and especially when, when you're young, really I would, I would recommend you go there as soon as you possibly can. Okay, as soon as, is there a question there? No. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so I, I would recommend that, that all of you try to go as soon as you possibly can. So anyway, if you go to Medina, Outside of the Masjid of the Prophet وسلم, is his grave. And his grave is in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, in the room where she used to be with him, because they used to have one room houses in those days. Um, and so 
that's where uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is buried, and that's where Abu Bakr is buried, radiallahu an, and that's where Umar, radiallahu an, is also buried. The three of them are buried there in, in, in the house of Aisha, radiallahu an. So anyway, um, uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day was sitting in the house of Aisha, radiallahu anha, and uh, <laughs> um, there was a knock on the door. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, he's at home, uh, like, you know, like uh, we sit at home on our on the weekends. So it was that kind of atmosphere. He was, he was uh, at home and, and he was very relaxed. And, uh, and uh, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was sitting at home, uh, he was sitting such that his, uh, uh, like half or more of his thigh was exposed. A half or more of his thigh was exposed. So, uh, uh, there was a knock at the door, and uh, uh, they had another room also there in, uh, along the house of Aisha. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went into that room, uh, outside of the private quarters of Aisha radiallahu anha. So when he went into the, uh, he went into the room, and then, you know, uh, he said, come in. And the person who came in was Abu Bakr, the father of Aisha radiallahu anha. So, so he came in and uh, he had some issues to ask the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded to him and then he left. All the time his thigh was exposed. You know, his, uh, both of his thighs, they were, they were exposed. Uh, so, uh, and you know, he was kind of like in a, you know, uh, uh, a, a relaxed position, kind of half la laying down. So, uh, after a little while, uh, there was another knock on the door, and Umar, radiallahu uh, an, this time came in. And he asked the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some, you know, some issues, uh, asked, about, asked him about some issues, and then after a little while, he left. And Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was still in the same state. He uh, had, you know, his thighs exposed, and uh, did not cover them, because Abu Bakr and Umar came in. Well, and, and during this entire time, Aisha, radiallahu anha, she's watching, you know, exactly, because, you know, the Sahaba, they, they tried to watch every move of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, every little thing that he would be doing, how he would speak, how he would, the expressions on his face, you know, how he would deal with this person or that person, they, they would, it's like they would be recording every little thing about the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because they, they looked at him as, obviously, as their role model, and, uh, as a, and from him, whatever he did, they tried to emulate that and try to imitate that. So she was watching all of this. And she noticed that, you know, how he dealt uh, with Abu Bakr and how he dealt with Umar. Well, after a little while, there was a third knock on the door. And uh, at this point, Abu Sallallahu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, come in. And this time, the person who came in was Uthman, radiallahu anhu. So before he came in, um, you know, when he knocked on the door and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, who is it? And he said, Uthman. Before he said, come in, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he heard it was Uthman, he quickly got up and you know, was in a lying down position, but he quickly got up and he covered his thighs and he covered his legs. And then he said, come in. So Uthman, radiallahu an, the Sahabi that we're talking about today, he, he came in, asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam some, you know, whatever his issues, and then he left. So now, Aisha, radiallahu anha, remember she, you know, she was very young. She, you know, you're talking about hardly 12 years old, maybe 11 years old, radiallahu anha. Uh, you know, uh, uh, she, she comes in, and, I mean, imagine now, she's about 11 or 12 years old, okay? Now, I mean, the intelligence, how smart she is and how perceptive she is. She's watching all of this and she comes in now and says, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, I noticed that when Abu Bakr came in, when my father Abu Bakr came in, you kept lying there and your thigh was exposed. When Umar came in, you kept lying there and your thigh was exposed. But when Uthman 
radiallahu anhu came in, all of a sudden you got up and you, you sat up and then you covered your legs all the way down and so on. Why, why, why did you do that for Uthman? So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and uh, again look at how perceptive Aisha radiallahu anha is, what she's watching and how she's looking at everything. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to her, Ala astahi min rajulin tastahi minhu al-malaika. That shouldn't I be shy of a man from whom the angels are shy to be in his presence? The angels are shy to be in the presence of Rahman. So the, the point that Abu Sus Allah was uh, was making is that Rahman radiallahu was so shy that even the angels, even the, you know, it's part of the nature of the angels to be shy. That they shyness means that they normally move away from anything that could be um, uh, that, that could be distasteful or anything that uh, would um, uh, tax another person or something that could be bad in any way, like disturbing somebody or things of that nature. So, uh, Rahman radiallahu anhu was so shy that uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had he seen the Prophet in that condition, he would have thought that uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was kind of resting and he would not have put himself forward on, <coughs> onto the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and without asking his question he would have just left. Radiallahu anhu. So Uthman was extremely, extremely shy. And again, this is a quality that uh, perhaps many of us as Muslims today are missing. And, uh, and actually, the, the quality of haya comes from iman. As Rasulullah sallallahu in a hadith, he said, you know, al-haya'u wal-imanu qarinan. You know that uh, haya and iman, you know, being shy, the quality of being shy and iman they, they are like companions. You know, they, they go hand in hand, they go together. إِذَا رُفِيَ أَحَدُهُمَا يُرْفَعُ الْآخَرُ if, if one of them is taken away, if one of them is uh, non-existent, then the other will be also taken away. So if you, if you, uh, if you notice that if you have Iman, you'll have Haya. If you, uh, if you don't have Iman, chances are you're not going to have the Haya. So, uh, so the, uh, uh, in a hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said Al-haya'u min al-iman Haya comes from iman The more iman you have The more you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you Everything that you do You can never be alone And so if you have that understanding If you have that type of a, a feeling Then it is very difficult to commit sins very difficult to do something that's displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching and you are, and you are shy to do anything uh, that Allah will be displeased with because after all the grace that has rained upon you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the blessings that rain upon you every moment of your life you, if, if you had iman you would be shy to do anything to displease someone like, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so so he was, Uthman uh, was extremely shy. Um, the second thing about Uthman uh, one day uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, again he went out and uh, it was, he went out to look for some water and so on. And, um, and, uh, and kind of, uh, it was kind of a, like a, this was very rare for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it was kind of recreational at the same time. Um, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw this well and he, there was a garden, uh, you know, there was a door, a gate to the garden and he went inside and he went to the well and on the, on the edge of the well, you know, the, the sill, he went ahead and he sat on it and he put his feet uh, inside the, the well, the water. And he was, uh, you know, just kind of sloshing <coughs> the, the, his feet and so on in the well. So uh, one of the Sahaba, uh, um, he saw that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, you know, from a distance, he saw the Prophet went into the garden and, he, and uh, perhaps he went to the well. So he said, oh, today is a perfect day. I'm going to spend, I'm going to dedicate this entire day to spend with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So 
he went and he saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi gave him the salams and Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam returned the salam, and he said to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that uh, I'm going to spend the entire day with you and I'm going to act as your gatekeeper. You know, the so Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam could relax. He wanted to be at the gate so nobody would disturb the Prophet. So this situation was going on and all of a sudden there was a knock at the gate and uh, this Sahabi, uh, uh, Abu Musa, he, he saw that it was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So he went back, he said, Ala you know, just, just wait there, wait there outside the gate, and let me check with the Prophet وسلم, that it's, if it's okay for you to come in. So he went to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, you know, Hada Abu Bakr, you know, this is Abu Bakr, and he's at the door asking to, يستدن عليك, you know, he, he's asking permission to come and see you. So should I let him in? So Rasulullah says, إِذْنِ لَهُ, go ahead and, and let him come in. وَبَشِّرْهُ بِالْجَنَّةِ And give him the glad tidings that he will go to paradise. Give him the glad tidings that he will go to paradise. <laughs> I mean, subhanAllah, imagine if uh, you know, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with, uh, with you today and he was to tell you that if you're going to go to paradise. You know, subhanAllah. Anyway, so, so uh, Abu Musa, he came out and he told uh, Abu Bakr, that uh, go ahead and go in, and the Prophet وسلم, is there in the well, and he says that uh, he congratulates you that you're going to go to paradise. So Abu Bakr عنه, he goes in and he uh, sees the Prophet وسلم, sitting on the sill of the well, and he also you know, t- uh, takes off his shoes and he um, uh, sits right beside the Prophet وسلم, on his right side, and he puts his feet in the well as well, he's doing exactly what the Prophet was doing. So Abu Musa is now at the door as the gatekeeper. After a little bit, uh, guess who knocks on the door? Omar. Omar knocks on the door. And uh, Abu Musa says, uh, wait, wait, just, just hang on and let, let me go uh, and ask the Prophet if it's okay for you to come in. He goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, Omar is at the door, wants to come in and see you. He has said, Malik, he wants to come in and see you, asking permission to come and see you. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, you know, Abu Musa goes to him, and, and so Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, "Go ahead and let him in, and wabashiru bil jannah, and tell him he's going to go to paradise." So he goes back. He tells them that you are allowed to come in, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says you're going to paradise. So Umar comes in, and he does. You know, he takes off his shoes. He, he sees both of the, Abu Bakr and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sitting at the cell on the cell of the well. So he comes and he sits on the left side of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now all the room has been taken up, the middle, the, the right, left. So Abu Musa goes back to uh, the gate, and he's uh, watching, you know, guarding the gate. And now Uthman, Nabi Allah comes and knocks. So he tells him the same thing, just wait, wait, and let me go and ask the Prophet. So he goes to the Prophet and he says, Hava Uthman, Yasidinu Ali. You know, this is Uthman, and he is asking for permission to come to see you. <coughs> So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, go ahead and uh, let him come in, إِذِنْ لَهُ Go ahead and let him come in, وَبَشِّرْهُ بِالْجَنَّةِ And tell him, tell him that he will go to paradise, مَعَ بَلْوَى He added something now, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, مَعَ بَلْوَى تُصِيبُ You know, that, tell him he's going to go to paradise, but there will be a trial that's going to befall him. But there will be a trial that's going to befall him. So, uh, uh, Musa, he comes out and he tells Uthman, go ahead, you're allowed to come in. And, uh, but the Prophet said, you are, uh, you are going to go to paradise, but you are going to go through a very grievous, grievous trial. You're going, to, you're going to go through a very hard trial. So when Uthman, when he heard this, he says, Ibn Nasbir, okay, if that's the case, then we'll be patient. You know, in another narration, it is said that uh, he said, Allahu Musta'ad, that we seek our help from Allah, you know, to, to, uh, to be blessed with patience. So Uthman radiallahu an comes and he sits across from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because Abu Bakr is sitting on the right and Ahmad radiallahu an is sitting on the left. So here, 
brothers and sisters, the, the issue uh, that's really uh, important to see is that he was a little different uh, from Abu Bakr and from Umar. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there's going to be a trial that he's going to go through. And, and surely he did go through a trial later on in his life, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And, but the issue here is that his reaction to the whole thing, you know, he said, إِذَا nasbir, you know, or Allahu musta'an, you know. Uh, he said uh, when he was told that he's going to go through a big trial, uh, he didn't, you know, he didn't throw up his hand and say, well, why me? You know, uh, Allah is not fair, that God is not fair, you know. And he didn't say anything like that, he said, we'll be patient. As a matter of fact, he said, Allahu musta'an, we seek, our, we seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, the, the issue here is to uh, basically to recognize that, that how, you know, he was not stressed in any way, uh, he, he was not negative, he did not complain in any way, because of the strength of his iman, the strength of his faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And knowing that he's going to go to paradise, uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he put the positive first, that he is going to go to paradise. And hearing that, nothing mattered. You know, no matter what trial that they would go through, it didn't matter. Because remember, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to the Sahaba, in the sil'at Allah ghaliyah, in the sil'at Allah jannah, that you know, the commodity of Allah is very expensive. And the commodity of Allah is paradise. You know, that, and so all the Sahaba, they were always you know, looking to see what they could do to seek paradise, to, to go to Jannah. And then they would do whatever, whatever sacrifice was needed, whatever hard work they had to do, whatever effort they had to put forth, they were ready to do it. You know, nothing was an excuse if you told them, that, okay, this is going to result in paradise. You know, from the Prophet Sallallahu or from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the Quran. So, uh, later on, uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, one time uh, they had gone on the, on the mountain of Uhud. And again, if you go to Medina, you should definitely go and see the mountain of Uhud. You know, it's, it's a huge uh, mountain that you will see. And you know, actual, actual battle took place over there. But uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, one time they went out to the mountain of Uhud. And he went with Abu Bakr and uh, Umar and Uthman. And uh, they went, they, they, you know, they climbed all the way to the top of Mount Uhud. In the Mount of Uhud. And when they got up top, uh, the mountain began to shake. The mountain of Uhud began to shake. So Rasul وسلم, he put his foot, his right foot, firmly down on the mountain. And he said, Uthput ya Uhud, fa inna alayka nabiyun wa siddiqun wa shahidan. Oh, shahidain. So, uh, which means, roughly, that O Wahid, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking to the mountain, saying, O Wahid, be steady, be steady. You know, don't shake, be steady. Because on top of you is a prophet, a Siddiq, referring to Abu Bakr, and two martyrs, you know, referring to Umar, radiallahu anhu, and to Uthman, radiallahu anhu. Okay. Now, again, here is, is, is a tremendous witness or t a tremendous testimonial from the Prophet وسلم, for Uthman because I mean imagine at that time you know this was uh, hardly the first few years after the Hijrah after they had moved to Medina and Rasul is telling Uthman that he is going to be a Shaheed that he is going to be a martyr in the future and basically the, the important lesson to learn from this is that First of, all, first of all, it's a testimonial from the Prophet on how great Uthman was and will be. Was in the sense that only a person who is committed to Islam will receive that honor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not just anybody. That you, in other words, the point being that you have to work hard all your life or as, as long as Allah wills. And maybe, just maybe, Allah will bless you with that honor of being a shaheed. And here, Rasul has seen already the commitment of Uthman to Islam, and Rasul is bearing testimony that how great he has been, and he will continue on this path, you know, until he gets his shahada. 
SubhanAllah. Again, it's a, it's a tremendous testimonial from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And later on you will see that he did become a shaheed, you know, shaheed, a martyr that he uh, had to sacrifice his life for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, uh, for Islam, for speaking the truth and for uh, embracing the truth. Um, in addition to this, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, one time Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, when they had just done Hijrah, they had just moved from Mecca to Medina. Uh, the Muslims had a big issue as far as getting water. And the problem was that there was this one well in Medina that was owned by a Jew. And the Jew, he, you know, it was a business for him. So anybody who wanted water, he would charge them money. And he knew that this was the only well, and so, you know, uh, he was making a profit out of it because it was a business for him. So, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tur uh, uh, turned to the Muslims, because most of the Muslims, you know, they were very poor. Only very few of them were, were rich. You know, like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was super rich, uh, you know, uh, uh, Umar radiallahu anhu was super rich. Uthman radiallahu anhu was super rich. So, and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was very rich. And the other Sahaba, there were very few of them. You know, uh, but most of the Sahaba, they were very poor. So, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gathered all the Muslims in the masjid. And uh, he said uh, to all the Muslims that, Man yashtari bi'ir Umar. Who is going to buy the well of Roma? Who is going to buy this well? And who is going to share uh, their pail with the pails of the Muslims? You know, the pail they would put inside the well to bring up the water. So who's going to share their pail with the pail of all, pails of all the Muslims? And whoever, whoever is able to get that, meaning the well of Roma, the Roma, Whoever is able to get this well, وَلَهُ بِهَا عَيْنٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ For that, they will re receive a, a, a spring, a fountain, you know, water in, in paradise. And actually, he didn't specify it was water, he just said a spring in paradise. They will receive a spring. Because if they get this, then they will receive a spring in paradise. So if they were to get this well for the Muslims, they would uh, get a, a, a spring of some liquid, water or juice or, or wine or something in paradise. So, uh, when Abu Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned this, all the Sahaba, <laughs> they were all quiet. Total dead silence in the masjid. Dead silence in the masjid. In the back of the masjid, one of the Sahaba got up and immediately left the masjid. And that sahabi was Arthman, radiallahu anhu. <coughs> he immediately got up, and he, it's not that he just like was taking his time walking outside the masjid, he raced, it's like he was running. He, he got up quickly and he ran out of the masjid. <laughs> so, so, I mean, subhanAllah, uh, it's, just, it's just amazing. He, he got up so quickly, and he ran out of the masjid, and he went to the well, and he went to the owner of the well, the, 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 the Jewish man. And he started negotiating with the man. He said, uh, you know, that I want, I want the well, you know, and how much are you going to sell it for? So, the man did not want to sell. So, Uthman, you know, he, he, he sat beside himself and sat there and said, so what, what to do now? The man does not want to sell the well. So what, what to do? So he, and, and this is, it, it tells you that how smart he was. He, he said, okay, how about if you sell me half the well? I didn't imagine somebody selling half the well. He said, sell me half the well. So the Jew said, what do you mean sell you half the well? He said, look. I'll buy half the well from you, and one day you take water from it, and the next day I'll take water from it. He didn't mention all the Muslims. He just said, I'll take water from it. <laughs> so, so the Jew said, okay, that, that sounds good. That sounds good. So the, 
Um, so he said, okay, so how much are you going to pay me for it? So Uthman <coughs> said, I'll pay you 12,000 dirhams for it. 12,000 dirhams. Now, of course, in those days, you know, that was 12,000 dirhams. And by today's standards, you're talking about probably 12 million dollars or something of that nature. I mean, it's very expensive. So, so he, he said, okay, I'll, I'll take it from you, uh, from you half the wealth for 12,000 dirhams. Well, uh, the Jew agreed. And so Uthman, radiallahu anhu, came back to the Muslim. He raced back to the masjid, and the Muslims were still there. And he told the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that uh, one day we can use the well, and one day the Jewish man is going to use the well. And so, after a little while, and Uthman knew that this was going to happen because he's very smart. He was a very smart business uh, businessman. So, after a little while, what happened was that on the day that Uthman had access to the well, all the Muslims would go there. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even opened it for the non-Muslims. You know, so everybody, uh, you know, when it was the Muslims' day, everybody would get the water for free. And when it was the Jewish man's day, everybody would have to pay for the water. So guess what happened? Everybody would go there on the second day. But on the day that they would go, they would take water for two days. And so pretty soon, nobody would go to the, the Jewish man, you know, on his day. So, so eventually, uh, the Jewish man came to Uthman and he said, look, you can have the well, you can have the other half of the well. So Uthman now was in a bargaining position. So Uthman said, okay, how much? So uh, he said, I'll give it to you for 8,000 dirham. And so he bought the entire well for 20,000, and, and now it was open to the Muslims and also the non-Muslims in, in Medina. Brothers and sisters, a couple of things about this. It, sh it kind of gives you a glimpse into the character of Uthman. Uh, first of all, when the Rasul them, gave them the proposal that whoever does this <coughs> gets a spring in paradise. Huh? Imagine if I was to say to you, you know, if I was to say to you today that brothers and sisters, on the 22nd of December, you know, Dalai Salaam is having a fundraising dinner at the Bethesda Marriott. And anybody who comes and whatever they give, they will get paradise. Okay? <laughs> Chances are that most of you are not going to be that moved. Say, oh, okay, well, I can get paradise because of Dalai Salaam. I can go to, uh, get paradise by going to Adam. You know, why, why is only that Dalai Salaam important? You know, Shaitan will come to us and say stuff like that. Uthman, radiallahu an, he was seeking paradise. So he moved. Boy, did he move. The rest of the Sahaba are all sitting. You're, you're talking about the giants like Abu Bakr and Uthman. Uh, I mean, Abu Bakr and Umar and Ali and Abdul Rahman and Auf and uh, Abu Dhabda and Abu Dhar. And, and, you know, all these great Sahaba, these giants are all sitting there. And, and he just gets up. And as we say, he splits and he, he goes straight. He races. He races to the... Uh, to the uh, to the well, you know, because he he badly wanted to get to paradise, and there was a sense of urgency. So that's the first thing, you know. How uh, the lesson for us today is that when Rasulullah uh, said or Allah Subhanahu wa Taala promises us paradise for doing certain things, how quick are we? You know, what are our priorities today, brothers and sisters? Um, he went there. And he negotiated with with the Jew. You know, he negotiated with him. And Arthman, it just shows you his business acumen and how smart he was. He knew that when the Jew refused, he said, "Okay, now, I've, but I've still got to get this. I've still got to get this." You know. So it, it was not it, the issue was not all or nothing. The issue was, okay, if I can get all of it, let me at least get a foot in the door, so to speak. You know, let me just get a foot in the door, just a little bit, you know? And, and so he said, okay, I'll negotiate it such that I get half of it. And, and, and he, he knew, he knew from the beginning, look, if I get half of it, and if I turn it over now to everyone, I mean, look at his thinking, his business acumen. That, look, if I get, and, and this business acumen, by the way, I'm talking about not in worthy terms, I'm talking about the, the akhirah. That because he turned it around, and he gave it, you know, for everyone to take it. So, uh, 
so his, you know, how smart he was in doing this. Because he knew that after, afterwards, when everybody is going to go and uh, get the water, that uh, eventually the, the Jewish man, he would have to turn over the well and he can buy it at any price from him later on. And it would be for everyone. So, so again, it just shows you that uh, how, how smart uh, Uthman uh, was. Um, on another occasion, uh, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one day they were in the masjid and uh, the masjid was so packed that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked that that uh, we need to expand the masjid. So, again, all the Sahaba, they were just sitting there. Guess who got up and raised out of the masjid? Uthman of the Allah. He got up and he raised out of the masjid and he, he went next door and uh, he saw a plot of land that was right next to the small masjid that never we at that time. And uh, he started looking for the owner. So there was a house not too far from there, so he went and knocked on the house. And the owner you know, came and he said, look, I want to buy this. I want to buy this piece of land right now. <laughs> so buy this piece of land right now. So, so the, the owner said, how much? You know, so, uh, so they, they negotiated and so on. And uh, Osman gave him the money right then and there and, and, and bought the land. And came back to the masjid while everybody's still sitting, raced back to the masjid and said, Ya Rasulullah, the land next door belongs to the Muslims now. We can expand the masjid. <coughs> Again, you see the sense of urgency. You see the sense of the response to the request of the Prophet This was Uthman, He didn't just sit around and, and say, oh, well, you know, on my way home tonight, um, uh, you know, when I get done with this program, I'm going to check it out. And then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll go back and I'll make a stakhara and a stashara and I'll, uh, <laughs> you know. Or, uh, or you know, I'll check my bank account, you know, and then, you know, and see if this is really worth it or not, you know. No, 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 no. Uh, again, by the way, I don't want you to misunderstand that we shouldn't do istikhara. We should definitely do istikhara. But what I mean to say is that some of us, you know, we do istikhara and it takes us a year, you know. <laughs> so that's, that's what I mean to say. But, uh, but anyway, um, uh, you see a sense of urgency from Uthman, uh, radiallahu uh, anhu. On another occasion, Uthman uh, uh, Rasulullah they went uh, to uh, they went to do Umrah in the sixth year of Hijrah. Uh, Rasulullah took along the Muslim. They wore their ihram clothing, and, uh, and they had the animals with them also uh, to uh, to go into Umrah and perhaps if they uh, they can also do some rites of the Hajj. But uh, the Quraysh. In Mecca, they stopped them. And of course, a lot of the Sahaba, they got very upset, and so on and so forth. And they stopped at this place, this place known as Hudaybiyah. And the uh, Rasul Wasallam, when he saw that, the, he, he tried to negotiate with the Quraysh, but they, but they refused. And uh, he, uh, 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 the Quraysh, they sent out somebody, uh, his name was Arwa. And they sent him out to negotiate with the Prophet and to see what the Prophet وسلم, exactly wanted. So Rasulullah when Ulwa came from the Quraysh to the camp where the Rasulullah had camped out at Hadidiyya, uh, Rasulullah said, Look, I have not come to Majid to Muhariban, Wala Ghazian, Wala Muqatilan. You know, I didn't come to, uh, to uh, declare war on you, I didn't come to fight with you all. I didn't come to, uh, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this to create terror or anything of that nature. The reason I came was Zainan li Baytillah Azza wa Jal. I came to visit the house of Allah. And I, I came to, to see the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why I came. So, <coughs> Urwa told him, well, the Quraysh don't want you to come. So, but in the, in the meanwhile, Urwa began to notice how all the Sahaba, how they were interacting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and he noticed that how the Sahaba, they, they were so close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, when he would go and he would do his wudu, the Sahaba were right near him trying to catch the water that was falling off his arms or falling off, you know, falling off his hands. And they, because they loved him so much, so this this person, Urwa, he went back to the Quraysh 
And he said, look, you know, I told the Prophet, I told Muhammad what you wanted me to tell him. And, but I'm telling you one thing. He said that I, you know, he, he used to be, like his position from the Quraysh was like a diplomat. You know, he would travel all over, you know, like what we have today, what we have the Secretary of State and so on. So this is what he was from the Quraysh. So he said, look, he was telling the chief of the Quraysh, he said, look, I've been to Kisra in Persia, and I've sat with him, and how his people are with, his, with this leader. And I've been with the emperor of Rome, Qaisar of Rome, and I've, I've seen how his people deal with him. And I've been, I've, I've, I've visited the Najashi, you know, the, the king of Abyssinia. And I know, and I've seen how the people interact with him. And he said, I swear by Allah, Wallahi. He said, I swear by Allah, Ma ra'aytu malikan. I have never seen a leader. I have never seen a leader like Muhammad. Whose people love, uh, whose people hold him in such great stature that I have never seen anybody else hold him and uh, hold a leader in that great of a stature. And I, he said, I swear by Allah that I have never seen a people love their leader as much as the companions of Muhammad love Muhammad. And he said that, and I, I'm telling you that if you ever hope to separate him from his companions, you will never do it. You will never do it. You will never be able to get to him. If you, if you, if this is what you're strategizing to do, so go ahead and, and think what you're going to do with this man. In the meanwhile, Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he himself wanted to send some of his envoys to the Quraysh to try to negotiate. So he picked this one. Sahabi, his name was Kharash, and he sent him to Mecca to, to talk to the Quraysh. The Quraysh almost killed him, and he barely escaped with his life. And he came back to the Prophet in Hudaybiyah. And you know, Hudaybiyah from Mecca, you're talking about maybe 15 miles, something of that nature, maybe 12 to 15 miles, something of that nature. So he came back to the Prophet who was camped out for the and told him what happened and he almost lost his life. So Rasul said, okay, uh, we'll choose somebody else. So he chose Umar. He said, okay, Umar, you're going to go as an envoy. And you know, of course, you know Umar. You know, Umar was huge. You know, uh, some of the historians, they say that he would be equivalent to a man who would be, today would be 6'8", 6'9", of that nature. It was huge, huge, and, and you know, extremely muscular and so on. Huge, you know, people would be <laughs> afraid of the, when they saw him. You know, they would be afraid of him. So, Abu Sallallahu Alaihi called upon Allah and he said, "You go as as the envoy, as my envoy, and relate this uh, relate this message to them." So, Umar said that, "Look, yeah, Rasulullah, I would, I have no problem. I'll go, and you know that I'm not scared of anyone." Because remember, Umar was the one that when he was leaving Mecca, all the Sahaba, they kind of left, like, you know, very secretly. You know, but Umar was the one who went into the right in the Kaaba, in, in front of all the chiefs of the Kaaba, and he said that, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> I'm leaving. Whoever wants to stop me, they can meet me outside Mecca. And their mothers will be sorry. <laughs> you know? So meaning that, you know, they would have a fight and, and he would, you know, kill them, you know. So, so anyway, so this was Umar. So, uh, so Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, I am not, as you know, I, nobody, I'm not scared of anybody there. However, I feel that it would be better if you were to ask somebody else who has more, of, uh, more leverage with the Quraysh than myself. Because you know they don't like me. <laughs> he said, you know that they don't like me. So, so it would be better if you send somebody who had more leverage. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, who? And guess what Umar said? Uthman. Uthman ibn Affan, ya Rasulullah. It'd be Uthman who, who would be the better person to go. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called Uthman, and Uthman went uh, you know, to relay this message to the Quraysh. Um, after he relayed this, you know, the place that he went to relay this message to, uh, was uh, right next to the Kaaba, because all the chiefs of the Quraysh they were sitting there. <coughs> they were having their meeting. 
And uh, so he went and he told them there. And after he told them, uh, Uthman, radiallahu an, after telling them, and of course they refused, they said, no, we're not allowing the Prophet of the Muslims to come in. Uh, yeah, as far as we're concerned, you guys can go back to Medina. Now remember, they walked all this distance, you know, from, from Medina to Makkah. Uh, I think they're talking about 250 miles. You know, and they didn't have Nikes or they didn't have cars, they didn't have, you know, not even camels. And over all the rocky terrain, they're walking, you know, a lot of them in bare feet. And, uh, and you know, in, in the Ihram clothing, mind you. I don't know if anybody has worn, the, for the men especially, you know, the two pieces of clothing. That they're wearing this clothing, not only that, but they're, they, are, they are herding animals with them. They bring animals, you know, to slaughter uh, near the Kaaba and so on. So, uh, so now the envoy says that uh, to, uh, you know, uh, the Quraysh, they tell Uthman, the envoy of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, we're sorry, we're not allowing you guys to come in. You, as far as we're concerned, you can leave. You, you can just leave. We don't care. So Uthman, he had, you know, because all the Sahaba, they badly wanted to see the Kaaba. They badly wanted to come and do tawaf around the Kaaba with the Prophet So Uthman, with tears in his eyes, you know, he starts looking at the Kaaba. You know, and starts looking at the Kaaba, and his you know tears roll down his eyes because this is what he's going to miss. So, but the Quraysh, they notice that how lovingly he's looking at the Kaaba. For Uthman, how lovingly he's looking at the Kaaba. And, and they say, they say to him that, look, if you want to do the tawaf, if you want to do some tawaf, go ahead and you do it. You know, no problem. You know what Ahmad says? What do you He says, ما كنت ليأوف به حتى يطوف رسول الله صلى الله عليه He says, I will not do the tawaf around the Kaaba until the messenger of Allah does the tawaf. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, think about this. If, if one of us was there, and you know, the, uh, they, they told us, uh, look, you, you can go do a tawaf, the Prophet, don't worry about him. You know? But, uh, yeah, I might as well get one in. <laughs> you know? But, but, but this is the tabiyya. You see, the Prophet Sallallahu how he taught them, and they loved the Prophet Sallallahu They loved him dearly, and they were not going to do anything without him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Although he had tears pouring down his, his cheeks, you know, but, and he, you know, he's just lovingly looking at the Kaaba. And this was his opportunity after being, you know, thrown out of Mecca and going all the way to Medina and coming all this way, walking, and, and you know, that finally he's right next to the Kaaba, but he says, no, I'm not going to do it until the Prophet does it. SubhanAllah. So, uh, uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, he, he begins to head back to the Prophet. But in the meanwhile, there's a rumor that starts. A rumor starts that Uthman actually went to some of his relatives in Mecca before going back. And he kind of like disappeared off the scene just for a few hours. Uh, in the meanwhile, a rumor goes up. And the rumor, somebody carries the rumor to the Muslim in Hudibiyah that Uthman has been killed. Uthman radiallahu anhu was killed. And so the Muslims, of course, they're extremely, extremely distraught, and uh, they, they, uh, they made all of all of the Sahaba along with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They all gather near a tree, and they make this, this, this pact. It's called Bay 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 al Ridwan. You know, the pact of, of happiness, meaning the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So they, they make this pact, and in, in this pact, they all put their hands together, and uh, it was a pact to, to, to the death. Basically, that all of them are going to go into Makkah and, and uh, you know, in revenge for Uthman, uh, they're, they're going to, uh, you know, they're going to, all of them, is going to be a fight till the end, fight till death. Um, and actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this in the Quran, in Surah Al Fatih, that how Allah was pleased with how they were. And actually, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all the Sahaba, they're, they're, they're like making a pact with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by shaking his head. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam holds up his right hand and says, This is the hand of Uthman. And this is my hand. And he brings the hands together like this in front of all the Sahaba. That Uthman is also making the pact with us. And so, as they make the pact and they're all getting ready now to march into Mecca, all of a sudden Uthman, they see him coming from the distance. And he's, 
he's totally okay and everything is fine and so on. And, and Uthman uh, relates the entire thing to them what exactly happened. And eventually the Muslims, they, they, uh, they return. Three years later, the Muslims get, they're back in Medina, the Muslims get news that they, they, uh, that uh, the Emperor of Rome, uh, Heracles, he is coming to attack them. And he's coming with an army of more than a quarter million. And Rasulullah <coughs> tells the Muslims that this is what's about to happen because you know Rasulullah got the news because he had his uh, his uh, scouts out in the field, you know, all around uh, in you know what we now call the Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula. So his scouts came racing back and said that you know this is what Heracles is, is uh, the emperor of Rome is planning. He's planning to come with his army of uh, 250,000 to Medina and take over Medina and kill everyone. Uh, Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, summons all the Sahaba to the masjid and informs them what's about to go down and what's about to happen. And the Sahaba. They, they all, you know, they're men and women, every, the whole town, all the Muslims are there. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, need, we need funds to buy uh, horses and camels and artillery, you know, like weapons, you know, like swords and, and spears and, and arrows and things of this nature. So we need to, uh, it's like a fundraising, basically. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is ask all the Muslims to come and give as much as they can. And this is where that famous incident happened. Remember, uh, I'm sure all of you heard that Umar you know, said, you know, when he heard this, he said, okay, today I'm going to beat Abu Bakr. Today I'm going to beat Abu Bakr. I mean, they were competing with each other. I mean, look at what they're competing in. You know, they're not competing to see who has the most beautiful uh, car or the most beautiful riding animal or you know, who can look the prettiest or you know, who has the biggest muscles or, you know, they're, they're not competing in these worldly things. You know, who has the best looking house, you know, and, and stuff like that. Um, so they're competing with each other to see who can give more money and who can outdo the other in good deeds, you know. Uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, you know that in these things, the good, these good things, that the people uh, compete with each other. Okay? So uh, Umar says, today I'm going to be Abu Bakr. Today, today's my day. Today's my day. I'm going to be Abu Bakr. So <laughs> Omar, Omar comes and uh, he, uh, he goes home and he brings half of his wealth and he comes and puts it in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Basically putting, putting it there in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as if this is, you know, the, nobody can beat him. So Abu Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam thanks him and then Omar says, uh, <laughs> because he's wondering, how about Abu Bakr? He says, by the way, uh, Abu Bakr, what did he do? So the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, uh, he gave all his wealth. <laughs> so so uh, uh, Umar was, you know, was surprised that he gave all his wealth. So the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I asked him, what did you leave for your family? You bring all your wealth, what did you leave for your family? So Abu Bakr responded, said, I left Allah and his prophet for my family. You know, he gave all his wealth. So, in the meanwhile, the other companions, they're, they're bringing as much as they can. There was a lady who brought her bed, and she said, I'm giving this in the way of Allah. And, and that's all she had, that's all she owned was a bed. There were other women who were bringing their jewelry. Other people were giving money, and you know, this all being placed in front of the Prophet As a matter of fact, there was a man who came uh, there, and uh, he said, um, Ya Rasulullah, and he was crying. He was saying, I want to go with you, but I just don't have any money. I, I have no money. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam excused him. He said, no, 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 but I have something to give. <laughs> I have something to give. I want to give something. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was surprised. He said, he just said he didn't have any money, and he didn't have any material possessions. So what's he going to give? So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what? So the man said, I donate my honor for the sake of Allah Subhanahu what he meant by that is that, he, he, and he went on to explain, he says that all those people who have backbitten me, all those people who slandered me, all those people who abused me verbally, I forgive all of them. That's what 
That's my subtle too. I mean, you think about this and you say that, how are they thinking? Look at their m mindsets. I mean, only somebody who is riveted, focused totally on the hereafter, can come up with something like this. He had, he had nothing, but he's going to donate his honor to people, can step on his honor, they can you know, besmirch his honor, do anything, but he, he's not going to say anything to them, he's not going to get upset at them because he's doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At this point, Uthman, he stood up in the back and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I give a thousand dinars for this mission, this mission with the booth. I give a thousand dinars. So Rasulullah thanked him, and this was more than anybody else could do. It was uh, even more than Abu Bakr, and it was uh, more than uh, Umar and everyone. So, <coughs> Rasulullah at this point he made a comment. He he said, "ما ضر عثمان ما عمل بعد اليوم." ما ضر عثمان ما عمل بعد اليوم. He said. Nothing Uthman does from here on out, the rest of his life, is going to hurt the man. Nothing in the future is going to hurt him. Meaning, that he may even slip and, 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 and do something wrong, it's not going to take his hereafter in any way. It's not going to be written down as a sin. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. What does this just think about that just for a second? He said, whatever Uthman does from here on out, even if it's a slip uh, here or a slip here or a slip there, it's not going to count against him. It's not going to count against him. SubhanAllah. So, I mean, think about this just for a minute, brothers and sisters. If you went to one of the fundraisers in one of the masjids, you know, anywhere, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter whatever masjid in the area, and, or whatever cause for a school or whatever, and, and you got that honor, as if the Prophet ﷺ was going to tell you, look, whatever you do from here on out, it's not going to count, it, count against you. It's I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's like you have it made. And remember, Rasul ﷺ is saying this to him after already announcing that he's going to go to paradise. And so you would think Uthman would say, okay, well, I have many now. I can retire. You know, I can just retire from Islam. Like I, I, the Prophet already told me I'm going to paradise, so I don't have to give anything now. You know, but still he gave a thousand dinars. And Rasulullah is still moving on. He thanked Uthman. He said this about Uthman, and he's still moving on with the fundraising. He said, so who, who, who else is going to give? Whatever they can give. Who else is going to give? Who else is going to give? So the people are now silent. You know, people gave everything that they had. So Uthman, he raises his hand, and Rasulullah uh, calls upon Uthman. And Uthman stands up. And remember, the masjid is packed now. There, there are men and women, Sahabiya, Sahaba, sahaba. Everybody is there. The whole town is there, and. Uthman raises his hand and he gets up and the Prophet sallallahu calls upon him and he says, Ya Rasulullah, He says, you know, bi ahlasiha wa athabiha, you know, uh, he says that, Ya O Messenger of Allah, I will donate 100 camels with all its, you know, with all the, uh, uh, all the foodstuffs and all the armaments and everything. I, I'll donate. <laughs> 100 camels like that for this mission. Uh, you know, uh, I don't want to make this too long, but, but brothers and sisters, if you were to count the value, like these days a camel sells for roughly, you know, if you were to go in Saudi Arabia or Yemen or someplace, a camel sells for roughly $2,000. Okay? And the foodstuffs and all the armaments and everything would cost you roughly $20,000 that a camel could carry, okay? So you're talking about roughly, let's say 20,000, let's just uh, keep it simple, $20,000, okay? Uthman 
you know, twenty thousand dollars for each camel, like the cost of the camel plus all the food stuff, the harvest, everything. Uthman brought bought a hundred of them. He said, I, I'm responsible for a hundred of them. You know how much that is? That's two million dollars. And that's after the Prophet said that nothing is going to harm Uthman from here on out. Nothing is going to count against him. He's already going to paradise. He's going to, get, he's going to be a shaheed. But Uthman doesn't stop there. It's not like he's retiring from Islam after getting all these, uh, all these blessings, all these rewards. You know, he said, okay, I, I can just hang it up now. I, I have it made, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay now. I'm going to be okay. I can enjoy the world now. I don't have to work so hard in Islam. No, no, no. They were committed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know? So, so Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thanks him and, and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam keeps on moving the head of the fundraiser and says, so who else is going to come? Who else is going to... Everybody's silent in the masjid. Rathman says, I'll donate a, another hundred camels with all, all of the goods on it. So that's two hundred. So another two million dollars. We could say. Again, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continues and asks the Sahaba, who else is going to give? Who? And, and you know, you have people like Abdul Rahman and Na'uf, and the super rich are sitting there, like Abu Bakr and Umar, and it's just that they would have given, but they didn't have more money, that's all they had. So, again, the whole masjid is quiet, and Rahman gets up and says, Ya Rasulullah, I, I'm going to give another 100 camels. And now it's 300 and six million dollars. Kept on, in this way, they kept on going up till he had given about 900 camels. Because it's like about 19, uh, 18 million dollars. Um, subhanallah. And Rasulullah said to him after they finished, Rasulullah said, Ma ala Uthman. Ma ala Uthman. Then nothing is going to hurt Uthman, nothing is going to count against Uthman after today. SubhanAllah. This, is, this was the sacrifice that Uthman uh, made in preparing this army that's known as Jaysh al the, the army that was during the hard time. Because at that time, when they amassed, when they, when they got this army together to face the Romans, at the uh, at the booth, it was extremely hot. Some of the narrations say it was so hot that you felt as if the rocks were going to melt. And yet the Muslims marched all the way up to the You know, it's about a thousand miles or eight hundred miles from from the deep. They marched all the way up there. And when they got there, the the Romans, you know, they were uh, they heard that the Muslims were coming and they were so afraid that they didn't even show up to the battle. But this was Uthman, Rabbi Allah. This was this was Uthman. Uh, when eventually, uh, after Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, Abu Bakr became the Khalifa and Uthman served in the Khilafah, and then Umar became the Khalifa and Uthman served during the time of Umar. And eventually, when Umar passed away, Umar appointed him as one of the six people to appoint the Khalifa. And eventually, those six people appointed Uthman to be the third Khalifa. And everybody stood up in the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, and they all gave their bay'ah, their, their allegiance to, uh, to Uthman عن, and he became the next Khalifa, he became the next leader of the Muslims. Um, after he became the leader, there are many different, uh, many things that he did. And among the things that he, he did, uh, that, uh, and again, we don't have time to go to all the different things, but one of the things he did was um, he ordered all the different governors in all the different Muslim provinces, and he ordered the the you know which is which would be equivalent to the Secretary of Treasury, you know the the person responsible for the Bayt al Man, the Treasury of the Muslim. Each province had their own little uh, treasury, so he told them all to uh, he sent them a letter that they all should fear Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and they should not uh, they should not. Uh, uh, you know, like store the money with them, they should give it out freely to their populations, and whoever is needy, they should give it out, and they should not hoard the money in any way. Uh, and then uh, 
he was himself was in Medina because Medina was really the capital of the Muslim Ummah at that time. And so he was in Medina and he instructed that at the, at the Masjid of the Prophet وسلم, anybody who would come there, they would get food to eat. You know, travelers or uh, the students of knowledge, students who were, people who were studying the Quran, or people who were studying, they would attend lectures and things of this nature. Anybody who would come to the masjid, they would get food. They would be given a package of food. You know? <coughs> so this is a sunnah that was started by our Quran of Allah. Today, I have gone to Saudi Arabia. <coughs> when you go there, you know, when you go there, you get these packages, these boxes of food. Uh, those, those of you who have been there, have you gotten those boxes of food? You know, when you go for Hajj, you know, you get these boxes of food that all the pilgrims they get. You know, uh, and the, the person who's doing it, his name is Al Rajihi. He's one of the, the Muslim financiers, one of the uh, you know, uh, Muslim bankers. And he gives it on his own expense to all the Hajjaj. You know, you're talking about three, four million people. So these boxes of food that they, they, they give to all the people who come. Brothers and sisters, this is a practice that was started by Uthman. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know what he says? He said that if you start a good practice, <coughs> anybody who follows in your footsteps, their reward you will get. And they will also get the reward, but you will also get the reward for it. So imagine, there's a practice that Uthman sallallahu alayhi wa started, and today, Al-Rajihi, when he's doing all this, all the four million people who get all that food is all going back. The credit is also all going back to Allah. And he's been long gone. SubhanAllah. I mean, this is, this is how the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what, what we mean when we say, Allah is Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. This is SubhanAllah. Um, eventually, uh, as Uthman was ruling, there was a, a man who appeared uh, he, uh, he, he was a Jew who had embraced Islam in Egypt. And he came to Medina to learn about Islam. And unfortunately, his intentions were not good. He came to Medina to learn all about the Muslims and to learn all about you know, different things about the Muslims and, and so on, and, and you know, where the problems were, where the weaknesses were, and so on and so forth. And then he left Medina, and he went to Basra, and he went to Kufa, and to Iraq, what we call modern-day Iraq. And he began causing problems. He began causing problems, uh, began to sow dissension among the Muslims. And, and he, he's the one who started this entire thing of aggrandizing Ali, عنه, you know, the, the cousin of the Prophet and he started this whole thing of saying that, look, every prophet had a, um, uh, had a, uh, not a companion, but had, had somebody who would carry his message after him. You know, a disciple, you can say. Every prophet had that. And, and, and the disciple for the Prophet Sallallahu was Ali, radiallahu anhu, because Uthman is the one who usurped the power and took the rights from Ali. You know, he started this, this nonsense. Uh, the, the, his name was Abdullah ibn Saba. Abdullah ibn Saba. And, uh, and then he started this whole thing of uh, saying that Ali was divine. Uh, and Ali himself, you know, rejected all of this. And actually, uh, uh, those people who were saying that Ali was divine, uh, Ali radiallahu anh, had actually had them burned at the stake, so to speak. And uh, for, uh, for saying things of that nature. Because, uh, you know, uh, uh, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is divine and, and uh, these people started doing sajda to Ali and uh, uh, he rejected that totally Ali anyway Abdullah bin Saba he began creating all this uh, uh, dissension among the Muslims and especially the new Muslims who were just coming into Islam they were kind of simple hearted and they, they were you know they they really did not know much about Islam so he was able to get a, a brainwash them and get a hold of, of their uh, their uh, their minds, so to speak, and and uh, eventually uh, he began having meetings with people all over, and he began telling them, look, you know, <laughs> emphasize this issue about Ali, and secondly, you know, begin criticizing your your leaders, and third, tell people that the, the leadership has to change. In other words, he was trying to foment dissension 
against uh, Uthman ibn Khalifa So uh, uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, when he heard about this, he sent two of the Sahaba to talk to Abdullah ibn Saba and to talk to these people. By this time, they had formed a group of about 3,000 people. And, and they all marched to Medina from Iraq. They all marched to Medina along with Abdullah ibn Saba. But Abdullah ibn Saba kind of just stayed in the background. You know, he didn't want to come in the front, but he was causing all the problems from the back. So these two Sahaba, they went to them and they talked to them, and they discovered quickly that the intention of these 3,000 people in Abdullah ibn Saba uh, was to was for one of two things. Either Uthman could leave, you know, abandon his Khalifa position, or he was going to be killed. So they, they came back and they told uh, Uthman, that this is was a, this is what a, was uh, this is what was about to go down. So Uthman عنه, he called a meeting in the masjid of all the people in Medina who were still there because a lot of the Muslims they had gone out and they were fighting different wars and some Muslims actually had even gone uh, some of the Sahaba they had gone or quite a few had gone for Hajj. So hardly anybody was in town, but still there was a good group of uh, people that was in town among the Muslims. So he called all of them together. And he said that these 3,000 people who have surrounded Medina, they're accusing me of these different things. And much of those 3,000, they, they, uh, they had come to the masjid also, you know, they, uh, from their post outside of Medina. These were the people opposed to Uthman And um, so Uthman said that, look, all these people are accusing me of certain things and these allegations that they have. And, uh, and, and here are my answers. You know, he was refuting all of the allegations. So he said, like, for example, these people are saying, you know, and because of these allegations, they wanted Uthman out of office. So they said that these people are saying that uh, uh, when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during Hajj, when he went to Muzdalifah, he combined his prayers. You know, because when you go to Muzdalifah, you, you pray, uh, Maghrib uh, three rakahs and you pray Isha two rakahs, uh, two units and you combine them. So you pray Maghrib and Isha together. So he said that uh, uh, the, pe uh, the people are saying that when I went to Muzdalifah, I prayed three Maghrib and four Isha, uh, and I didn't pray the two. And that was going against the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was going against the practice, it was in conflict with the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is something that is wrong, and for that he should leave office. So Uthman he said that, look, this is what they're saying, and my answer to that is that I had family who was living in Muzdalifa. For me, that was like a second home. And therefore, it's like I went from one home to another home, and therefore, instead of praying two, like for travelers, I prayed four. Now this was Uthman's uh, ishtihad, you know, it was his, his, his uh, uh, way of looking at things, and which was, which was uh, okay, it was not something that was haram. So, so he said that's the answer to the first question. The second issue was that the people said that they accused him of uh, taking money from the treasury for himself. And he said to the people, look, you know, when I came into office, I was the richest among you. I was the richest among you. I had more animals than anybody, you know, like camels than anybody. Now I only have one or two. Is that true? Do you all, are you, do you all bear witness? You know, is this, is this, do you all bear witness that that's the case with me? So everybody said, Allahumma na'u. You know, we swear by Allah that that's the truth. You know, with all the Muslims who were there, not those 3,000, but all the, the, the Muslims who were there. So, Fahman said, the third allegation that they're uh, putting against me is that uh, they say that I changed the Qur'an. Like the Qur'an at the time of the Prophet was not assembled in a book, and now during the time of Uthman, Uthman, you know, was one of the people, you know, he was the one who assembled the Qur'an in a book form. You know, it was the first time during the time of Abu Bakr, then during the time of Umar and but Uthman, the Quran that we have today is, is the one that Uthman عنه, put together. So they're saying that I, I did something that the Prophet didn't do. 
So Uthman uh, said, look, Abu Bakr did that, and the Prophet recommended it, and Umar had it at his time, and now I'm just carrying on the tradition, and I've made more copies of it. So there's nothing haram about that, there's nothing wrong about that. So the, the Uthman said, Is, isn't, that, isn't that the case? Does everybody agree with me? And the people said, Allahumma na'am. Oh Allah, you know, we swear by Allah that yes, that's the truth. So then he said the fourth allegation that they're making against me is that I am giving money to all my relatives. I'm giving money from the state treasury to my relatives. And he said that you can see how my relatives are living. And you can see what I have. And I swear by Allah that all the money that I've given to the relative, not a single part of that has come from the treasury. It's all my money, and it is my money that I have given to them. And to the, uh, he said that to the degree that I do not even take a salary from the, uh, from the treasury. And all these, all, all these uh, years that, you know, that I've been uh, the Khalifa, it's on my own wealth. It's on my own money. I have not taken, a, uh, you know, I've not taken anything from it. So then he said, you know, uh, do you all agree to this? Is, is this, is this what, what it is? So everybody, the, the Muslims were there from Medina. He said, Allahumma na'am. Oh Allah, yes, the, uh, yeah, we serve Allah, that's the case. So at that point, uh, the Muslims who were there, they said, Ya Uthman, Ya, ya Khalifa to Rasulullah, O oh, Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah. We heard, one of the people said, we heard a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Man da'a ila nafsihi aw ila ahadin that whoever calls people to themselves, you know, wa ala nasi imam and, and, and the people already have a leader and somebody else is calling to, to themselves, you know, or to one of them, fa alayhi la'natullah wa qutulu. And so, Anybody who does this, well, the people already have a leader, but other people try to foment dissension and try to have another leader, then on them is the curse of Allah, and they should be killed. Kill them. And this was the hadith of the Prophet So Uthman, you know, when, when a couple of the people, they told him, this is what we should do, is to kill these 3,000 people. They, these people are just causing dissension. And then, and they are going against uh, you know, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he said, listen to his, uh, his answer. He says, Kalla. Kalla. He said, never. He said, never. Bal na'fu wa naqbal wa nubassiruhum bi jahlina. He said that we will, forgive, will be forgiving and we will accept th their ignorance, what they're trying to do, and we will show them through our ignorance of their transgression, meaning that we will ignore what they're, what they're doing. And he said, لا نقتل أحدا. He said, uh, we will not kill anyone حتى يرتكب حدا أو يبدي كفرا. And we will not kill anyone, anyone unless, unless, they, uh, unless they deserve a punishment that is mandated by the Quran. Or they purposely hurt the Muslims by disbelieving or they do something that's uh, you know, against the Muslims in that case. Uh, we're not going to kill anyone, he says. We're not going to kill anyone. I, so the Sahaba, they said, okay, but these people are going to kill you. So Rahman says that we will deal with that. So the Sahaba, they come to him in the middle of the, that night after everybody disbands. You know, the, some of the, you know, the, the main Sahaba, the, 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 the leaders like Ali, radiallahu anhu, and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, and, and others, they, they come to uh, uh, Uthman in the middle of the night, and they say, Ya Khalifa of Rasulullah, O Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah, why don't you send out for the armies, you know, to all the Muslim uh, areas, like, you know, in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, you know, the Islam had expanded to all these directions, and to Yemen, and summon the Muslim armies to come and save me from these 3,000, you know, the, the, these 3,000 people, these renegades. Why don't you call, call, uh, you know, summon them to protect you? 
So you know what our friend says? He says, "Ma uhibbu an alqa Allah wa ala unufi damu mri'in muslim." He says, "I do not want. I do not have any intention of meeting Allah, of meeting Allah, and on my neck is the blood of a single Muslim." In other words, what he was saying that if the armies come, they're going to kill people indiscriminately. And if a Muslim dies because of me, because of protecting me, I don't want to meet Allah with blood on my neck, with blood on my hands. SubhanAllah. This is the leader of the Muslims. You see? This is how the Muslims work. This is how the Prophet nurtured them. This is how the Prophet brought them up, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were not about war, they were about peace. So then the Sahaba, the Sahaba they said, okay, if you're not going to call, call out to the armies, then why don't you just go ahead and, and at least, then you should move. You should leave Medina and go somewhere else. You want to protect yourself. <laughs> You know what he says? Because you know he was they were sitting in the masjid of the Prophet. You know, and right outside is the grave of the Prophet and in the room of Aisha So they say, why don't why don't you just move? Move to Syria. You know, some of you relatives are in Syria like Muawiyah uh, and others, they why well, move to Syria, you'll be protected there. He says, Ma kuntu يَخْتَارُوا جِوَارًا عَلَى جِوَارِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ He says, I'm not going to be the one who is going to, who is going to um, choose a neighbor other than, the, other than being the neighbor of the messenger. So the Lord. In other words, what he was saying, <laughs> look, I'm right next to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Why would I go anywhere else? Why would I choose another neighbor? Even though the Prophet Sallallahu was dead, they said, why would I choose another neighbor? Besides, I'm right next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here in the Masjid al Nabawi. Why would I choose another neighbor? Why would I have a need to go anywhere else? SubhanAllah. This is how they love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even after he's passed away. So, this, this, this vanguard of Sahaba, they, they told us, Oh, you know, oh, Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah, why don't you at least summon an army from Syria? You know, from uh, from your relative, from from Muawiyah, from Syria, from Damascus. He will send you an army to protect you. And so it just so happened that Muawiyah then also joined them, came in, and he said, you know. I'll send the, I'll, I'll summon my army to protect you. And he says, you're going to bring an army, and they're going to come, and they're going, there's going to be skirmishes all over, all over the city, <coughs> and, and Muslim blood will be spilled. No, 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 no. I don't want any Muslim blood to be spilled at all. Because you know those three thousand, they were considered Muslims also, and I don't want the fight between Muslims. No, no. Not because of me. So then Muawiyah, he said, either Satuqtan, then you're going to be assassinated. You are going to be assassinated. These people are going to kill you. Don't you understand? Rahman, very calmly, very calmly, he says, either Hasri Allah or not. He says, that Allah will suffice and He is my best friend. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the following uh, that that night after the Sahaba left, uh, Uthman, عنه, he went to sleep. He wanted to get up for the Hajjah. He got up for the Hajjah a little bit later, but he went to sleep that night and. He saw the Prophet 
and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Ya Uthman, after Muhammad, O Uthman, break your fast with this Break your fast with this The next day, Uthman got up and he was fasting. Fasting the whole day. Just before Muhammad, these bunch of hooligans, they, they came into they came into the house, they barged into his house. He was there with his wife, Nahida, called his Roma. And he was reading the Quran, Rabbi Allah. And he totally ignored them. He, he knew they came in, but he didn't look at them at all. He didn't give them any attention. He kept on reading the Quran. Totally immersed in the Quran. One of them, he had a dagger and he hit him on the head. And he kicked the Quran that was in his head. Imagine, these people were saying that they wanted to do what's good for Islam and they wanted to remove Uthman, one of the greatest Sahaba. And they kicked the Quran. And they, and this, this person, you know, his name was Waqib, he kicked the Quran. And the Quran went up in the air and then he it back and then it was the Quran. Hmm? It was but when it landed back, Uthman had a deep gash on his head and blood was spilling from it and it came onto the Quran. As Uthman was holding the Quran. And he kept on reading the Quran. As he's reading, um, another person and another one of the group, he hits him, and then Uthman, uh, he, he straightens up a little bit, and his wife rushes to protect Uthman, but in the meanwhile, this, <coughs> this other man, the second man, he thrusts a spear into the stomach of Uthman, a sword. He sticks the sword in the stomach of Uthman. And Uthman passes away at this point, killed, assassinated. And Naira, uh, his wife, comes to try to protect him, but he chops off her hand also. And she's also bleeding. So at this point, she falls. A third man comes in, and Uthman radiallahu an, right before Maghrib he passes away. Right before Maghrib he passes away. And he has seen that dream last night. So why don't you break your fast with us? The third man comes in, and he strikes Uthman nine times in the, in the chest. And he says, three of those are for the sake of Allah, and six of them are for me because I have grudges against him. After he's dead. And these people wanted to gain the leadership of the Muslim. SubhanAllah. So, and then after Uthman of Allah, he passed away. This group of people refused for Uthman to be buried in Fatir. You know, the the the, 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 the graveyard that's right outside where more than 10,000 Sahaba are buried, mm-hmm. right outside the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't let him be buried here. So he was buried behind, actually, the, the graveyard at that time. Later on, when Mahawiyah became the Khalifa, he included that part in the in the Bakiya al you know, in, in the graveyard. And so today, of course, his, his body is, uh, is grave. Is part of that uh, Brothers and sisters, this is, uh, um, I think I've gone quite a bit, but inshallah, I've tried to really give you a, a quick overview of his life. And um, uh, as you can see, he is one of the greatest of the companions of the Prophet.
and, uh, and there's a lot, uh, uh, believe me, uh, I've not even scratched the surface. You know, to talk about his life uh, would take at least 20, 20 to 30 lectures, you know, of, uh, uh, at least one to two hours a piece, you know, of all the different things that he did in his life. And, uh, I'm just giving you a brief overview. And certainly in these uh, moments, uh, I hope that you had a gush of Iman and you had a surge of Iman uh, to uh, renew your commitment to Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala and to understand that as Muslims, as we live in America, uh, we must take our responsibility very seriously. And uh, there's a lot to do, uh, there's a lot of work, and we, uh, there's a lot of responsibility. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us, as He said, Then on that day, the day of judgment, you will certainly be asked about all the blessings that you receive. Uh, brothers and sisters, each one of us, uh, we live uh, living here in America, uh, despite the challenges that we face, uh, there are a lot of blessings. You know, you have the freedom to speak, you have the freedom to talk, you have the freedom to invite others to your team, you have the freedom to eat, to drink, to travel, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to enjoy yourself, to relax, to sleep, to be secure, to be safe. These are all blessings. These are all blessings. Can, each one of us can really develop our Islam, can really get, uh, commit ourselves to getting closer to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, America is having tremendous problems. They don't know what the solution is. I uh, mean, you see the debate that's going on in the media today about the fiscal cliff and all of that stuff. Uh, but the bankers have basically cleaned out America. You know, they they, they have taken so much money. The the uh, the pressure on the poor. You know, uh, each one of us, uh, as you as you grow up, as you get out of college. Uh, I mean, you would say to yourself, look, I'm getting such a great profession, but I still can't make ends meet. You know, I have to work two jobs, I have to work three jobs, there's health insurance, there's, there's uh, you know, there's a, uh, uh, there's a family to take care of, there's this expense, there's that bill, there's this bill, I have to send my children to college. And things, all those, all those things, uh, you know, the, the social bills, the crime, the, the broken families, you know, the, the, the spiraling uh, divorce uh, rate in this country. Uh, all these things, brothers and sisters, you are Muslims. And Islam has a solution for all of them. But, but all of us as Muslims, we've got to kind of study and learn what's the, you know, how, how does Islam address these things. Like for example, when it comes to banking, there's Islamic finance. Each one of you should think about majoring in Islamic finance. This is the, this is the way of the future. You know, if you like accounting, if you like, uh, you know, math, if you like, uh, you know, like that area, go into finance. You know, finance in the world today is the number one profession. It's ahead of IT, by the way. It's ahead of IT. And, and more and more uh, non-Muslim banks, you know, you're talking about like Chase Manhattan and, and Bank of America and, and Chevy Chase and, and Capital One and all these huge, huge banks. They're all looking into Islamic finance. Some of them actually have uh, started departments in Islamic finance. You know, so as, as Muslims, we need to uh, establish Islamic banks, not only for us as Muslims, but for the non-Muslims. We need to show them, that, look, here's a solution. Here's a real life solution. We don't, we're not people who just talk. You know, we talk the talk, but we walk the walk also. You know, we're people who are people of action. When it comes to like, for example, in this uh, in, in America, we, we have a huge problem with with uh, with me, uh, you know the whole the medical bills and health insurance and all of that. I mean, you know that that battle has been waging for the last four years, and now it's going to be challenged at the uh, at the Supreme Court level and all of those things. We as Muslims, we have a way to have health insurance the Islamic way. There's an Islamic way to do this. Uh, it's all talked about in the book books of fiqh. Again, I don't want to go into all those details. I just want to share some of these things with you to show you that as Muslims, we have solutions for the problems of America. We have to step up to the plate. And we have to kind of uh, start, to get, you know, not only to study this, but then to begin to share it with not only Muslims, but also non-Muslims. 
you know, when it comes to medicine, why is it that all medicine has to have alcohol as a base? Is that necessary? As Muslims, why don't we look at honey? The Quran talks about that. The Prophet talks about it. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, you know, shifa. You know, that, that in this, the, in honey, there is a cure for everything. You know, how about the black sea? As Muslims, you know, those of you who are going to pharmacy, why can't we have Muslim pharmaceutical plants that look into all the, what we call the Qudb al nabawi you know, the, the medicine of the, uh, of the messenger, of, of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So many different things that he recommended that we should be uh, eating and, and, uh, and dealing with. And th this, th these, the, the research that we do, the cure that we find, is not just for us, it's for the non-Muslims as well. Imagine the tremendous da'wah. If we are of service to our nation here in America, those of us who have been born and raised here, you know, who are planning to be here all their lives. These, these are just some examples. There's a lot of stuff that, well, uh, uh, education. Education is, is a big problem in the nation today. More and more families are taking their kids out of public school and they're homeschooling their children. They're homeschooling their children. Why? Because they do not trust the character that is being imparted in the public schools and even in the private schools. We as Muslims can step in and have Islamic schools, not just for the Muslims, but also for the non-Muslims. The, the character that they will gain will help this nation. The education that they will gain will help this nation. You see, brothers and sisters, the core of the Islamic curriculum is the skiyat al nafs, the purification of the soul. That's missing in the Western curriculum. So these are just some ideas. And I'm sure all of you will come up with even other ideas. But as young people, young men and women, brothers and sisters, there's a lot to do. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that we are responsible for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's face it, you're not here just because you wanted to be. No, Allah made it possible for you to be here. Whether your parents came, or whether you just got a visa, or you just got citizenship, whatever it is, Allah put you here. Allah put you here. Not to just criticize the system, but to provide solutions for the problems that this nation is facing. And this is what Uthman was all about. He was just reflecting the tarbiyah, the way that the Prophet raised us. To help people. To help people. And this is who the Muslim is. So inshallah, I'll finish with this evening. And uh, again, brothers and sisters, uh, thank you so much for listening. And um, uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, yes? Good question. Um, two questions, it's short though. Um, what was the relationship of Muawiyah and Uthman, like uh, relative wife? And um, those 3,000 people, were they already considered uh, Shias? No, no. The, the 3,000, they were not really Shia. Uh, they were just people who were against the rule of Uthman. Uh, the Shia came a little bit later at the time of the year. Uh, as far as the relationship of Muawiyah and Uthman, uh, and uh, I don't remember exactly, like, uh, I mean, they were, yeah, I think they were cousins or, or uh, from what I remember, I think they were cousins, not cousins. Uh, but um, exactly like how distant they were, I don't remember. Why did they, did they oppose Uthman's authority? <coughs> Those 3,000? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, the thing was that it was fomented by this person named Abdullah ibn Sabah. You know, basically, the, the issue was that they were trying to do the same thing that they did, they did to Christianity. Second. Yeah, because, you know, like in Christianity, what happened was that uh, there was uh, a person who was Jewish, um, and he, his name was Saul of Tarsus. And he became a Christian, and he was later on called Paul. And he's the one who came up with all those strange ideas like Trinity and 
and all those different things, you know, uh, and, and like the wine, you know, drinking wine and uh, the pork and, you know, the pig and so on. And many other things, the resurrection, all these things were introduced by Paul. You know, and so the same thing was attempted with Islam as well, through Abdullah ibn Sabah. But Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the deen and it did. How did he die in this Abdullah ibn Sabah? Uh, I don't remember now. Uh, I don't know if he, I thought he was executed, but, uh, but I don't remember exactly. Uh, he wanted to protect Uthman. The idea was to he was trying to convince Uthman to go to Syria, to Damascus, to, so Uthman will not be attacked. I think he was appointed, from what I remember. He was appointed to be the governor of the Obviously, I mean, they, they were monastics, in the, they were hypocritical. You know, monastic is uh, the translation is hypocrites. Uh, because, you know, to come and kill a Sahabi, you know, that's a big thing. That's a big, big thing. You know, you know, you know, like uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, don't even abuse them verbally. Now you're going to kill one? You know, that's... Uh, uh, like he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever just even abuses them verbally, it's like they're abusing me, meaning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's like if you insult a Sahabi, you're insulting the Prophet. It was that severe. Yeah, yes. How many years he, he was serving in the office? How many years was he in the office? He was a, a Khalifa. Ah, I don't remember now exactly. I, uh, I, don't know, was there, I think it was about seven years, maybe, or eight or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Uh, Alright, um, this was one final thing I just wanted to say, uh, brothers and sisters. Um, as you know, last time when we met, uh, we were talking about a new property that the Allah Salaam is moving to uh, the school and so on. So, uh, it's a new property that's about 66 acres uh, in Cooksville, Maryland. And inshallah, uh, on the 22nd of December, we're having a fundraising dinner at the Bethesda Marriott. Uh, Brother al Hussein Hussain will be there, Sheikh Karim al Zayd will be there, and Imam Sarah al Haj will be there. Uh, so, inshallah, we uh, are inviting all of you to come and uh, just uh, come and just join us, inshallah, uh, as we try to move forward on this new property. Uh, it's uh, another school building and so on to expand uh, the, uh, the community of the Muslims. So come and join us. If you, uh, you can go to the website to get more information. It's called homeoftheheart.org. Homeoftheheart.org. And you get all the information. Uh, it's at the Bethesda Maria. And uh, inshallah, even if you cannot, it's $50 a piece. But if you cannot afford it, that's not that's not important. Inshallah, just come, just come. That's the most important. Even if you don't have money, that's not important. The important thing is just just to come, 
And inshallah, if you're inspired, make a dua for, for, for the school and make a dua for Dar al That's all we ask of you, inshallah. So as many of you, and if you're coming, bring your friends. Uh, as many of you that can come, inshallah, the, the hall is huge, and inshallah, we hope to be able to pack it. So just, just come, inshallah, and, and enjoy the evening. Um, if I can have everyone's attention, uh, we're going to be having the refreshments ready and set. But before we go into uh, line, uh, we're going to have uh, Brother Ibrahim Shafi'i to come and give us a small Quran recitation. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha